Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Camden Opera House. My name is Dave Morrison. I'm the manager. We are so happy that you've joined us tonight. It's going to be an amazing night, so we're glad you're here with us. Tonight's concert is sponsored by the Community Arts Fund, which is you. Donations come in through our mailings or when you buy tickets on our website or even the donation buckets in the lobby. However you contribute, thank you so much. We couldn't do it without you. The Community Arts Fund has made the past two years of soundcheck uh, performances possible, as well as the Blue Cafe, which will be back, last year's free summer sounds concert, free movies, and more. We have some great shows coming up. Singer-songwriter David Dodson, bluegrass stars Ethan and Finn, jazz artist Andrea Carlson, Pokey Lafarge is coming, the Brubeck Brothers here for Jazz in June, Guitar virtuoso Johnny A is coming for uh, the Windjammer Festival. So please have a look at our website. It's camdenoperahouse.com because these are great shows and we would love to have you back. Finally, I want to thank our staff. I want to thank Juniper and Luke and Dagny and our volunteers who are just awesome. It is their amazing work and dedication and good cheer that make this all happen. So thank you to them. Okay, tonight's show is something that we have been looking forward to for a very long time, and we're really excited, as I'm sure you are. Paul Sullivan is an acclaimed writer, composer, and pianist who has won a host of awards, including a Grammy. It's an honor to have him here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Paul Sullivan.
Thank you. Thank you so very much. This is a great thrill for me. I am so excited to be here. There is no place I'd rather be on earth than right here, right now with you. And I hope that in the next hour, because that's all we have, uh, I'll be able to make you feel the same way. I welcome all my friends, neighbors, uh, old friends, supporters, fans who have been so good to me for decades now, and I know that many of you are here, and I know that many of you uh, had to drive long hours in the rain to get here, and I am very grateful to you. I also want to welcome and say hello to uh, all the people in the Cyber Village who are watching this on their devices. Uh, <clears throat> I know that there are many of you, and uh, including some formidable musicians who have tuned in just to make me nervous, and it's working. Uh, <clears throat> I also want to give a shout out to Eileen and Bill, uh, friends of ours, who are watching this from the Philippines, and presumably over their morning coffee. Uh, and I think they must get the prize for longest distance. Anyway, welcome to everybody. The songs that you've just heard were my songs. Most of the songs you'll hear tonight are my own. Uh, <clears throat> I played Parade, and then one that I wrote years ago call, called The Promise of April. And I thought that was an appropriate song to start us off with. I, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to play another song of mine now for you. And uh, those old True Blue fans of mine have heard this one quite a lot. but. Maybe you'll be happy to hear it one more time. Uh, it's called Hawks Fandango. I wrote it about an experience I had as uh, artist in ro uh, residence at Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. And <clears throat> I won't go on, but it was basically I, I climbed up a tall hill by myself. Uh, I'm not exactly the Ernest Shackleton type, and this was quite an adventure for me. <clears throat> and I was tired when I got there, and I lay down on my back, and I just stared at the sky, and uh, it was a still, hot uh, summer day when a hawk came into view right over me, and it was exciting and beautiful, and it, it lingered in my field of vision, and uh, I just stared at it for so long, and then it got better because another hawk joined it, and the two of them did these great lazy spirals, and they swirled upward on the thermal that I was probably producing myself from having climbed up the thing. <laughs> uh, anyway, they were great company for uh, 20 minutes, a half hour or so, and then I trundled my way back down and wrote this song called Hawk's Fandango.
Thank you very kindly. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm weeping over the beauty of my own play. No, I'm actually it's getting a little hot up here. Uh, yes, Danny Boy, and I think we all have a Danny Boy, and that was dedicated to yours. I want to, very excited to be playing this next piece for you. I didn't write it, but we'll wait for that phone call to get through. Uh, <laughs> the, this piece was written, it's a nocturne, which is a, a night piece, but that's just kind of a generic name that, uh, that Chopin, the composer, used for a lot of his pieces, and not just he, but it, it was a genre for a while, a nocturne. <clears throat> for a long while. But uh, Frederick Chopin, uh, uh, this piece has enchanted me since I was 12 years old when I first heard it, and I haven't ever stopped loving it and playing it and listening to it and thinking about it. Uh, and I am in good company because not just this piece, but just about all of Chopin's music. He wrote it, he lived 200 years ago, give or take. And he, his music has meant so much to so many people that it has been played for those 200 years, I would say nonstop. Somewhere in the world, someone is always playing Ch uh, Chopin. And that has been so for 200 years, and it continues unabated. More people play it and love it. It speaks to their hearts now than ever, just because there are more people. But, I mean, at this moment, a dear friend of mine, uh, the pianist, the great pianist, George Lopez, I happen to know is in the middle of an all Chopin recital that he's performing in New Hampshire at this moment. We spoke last week. He said, yeah, I'll be, I'll be right in the middle of it when you're <coughs> playing your Chopin. So that's just two of us uh, doing our part to keep keeping the Chopin going. Anyway, it's, uh, it's quite a legacy for uh, a man who never lived to see his 40th birthday uh, to have changed the musical world so profoundly. And this piece, uh, this piece can be, I mean, this piece doesn't necessarily mean anything what you meaning you give to it is as valid as any meaning that anyone gives to it. But I can tell you what I'm thinking about in case it's a way into the piece for you. <coughs> and to me, it is, a, it, it is an incredibly subtle uh, musical painting of a storm. And that's a common theme in music. And, you know, it, uh, Beethoven made it very famous and his pastoral symphony and there's usually a lot of timpani and, <laughs> and uh, scary kind of things like that. And But this storm of Chopin's is, I think, more of a, an interior storm. And it just, you'll, you'll hear it all. It comes on so subtly, it, suddenly, uh, subtly, not suddenly. It comes on very subtly and uh, you'll hear gathering for it starts off with a most innocent beautiful childlike love but then it gets clouded and you'll hear a wind start and and just darkness creeps in and it gets quite urgent and there's resistance to it anyway and then it it resolves at some point and uh it could be a child it could be someone you love it could be your spouse it could be you it's all of us. We all have our storms. And this is, I think, about those storms. So I hope you will enjoy. I know you won't remember any of that. But uh, uh, maybe you can get a, a little bit inside this piece from those words. And I hope you will enjoy the Chopin Nocturne in B major, Opus 9, number 2.
Thank you kindly. Thank you very much. Glad you liked it. Now for something completely different. I want to play an old, uh, well, old 1933, 90 years old or so, uh, a song called I Cover the Waterfront. And I thought that would be appropriate for playing in Camden. Although in the current real estate market, I was thinking a better title would be I Covet the Waterfront. <laughs> but uh, we'll leave that for another time. Uh, the song was written, as I said, in 1933 by Johnny Green, very American name. And before I play it, though, I need to tell you about someone who uh, was as important to my performance of this piece as Johnny Green, who wrote the thing. And that is Art Tatum. And Art Tatum, for those of you who may not be that familiar, was, uh, very simply put, one of the greatest geniuses to ever touch a piano keyboard. He was an African-American, <clears throat> grew up in modest circumstances, was blind, and he pretty much single-handedly, well, both-handedly, uh, he set the standard for jazz piano at a height that has never been approximated since. And he's been dead since 1956. There have been, as we all know, other geniuses to play jazz piano, many of them. But I don't think any single one of them would deny that Art Tatum is the king. Uh, you just, he's sort of the Shakespeare to other playwrights. And uh, so his, I have been, I mean, just to show you that I'm not alone in this worship of Art Tatum, uh, Vladimir Horowitz used to go to nightclubs to hear him play, as did George Gershwin. Uh, lots of stories. Don't even get me started about Art Tatum. <laughs> but uh, I have been completely uh, devoted to Art Tatum and his recordings since uh, I first heard them, maybe when I was 14, 15 years old. <clears throat> and I just never get tired of listening to them. And I have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours listening to his recordings. Uh, and of course, I have tried to assimilate whatever I could in my humble way. Uh, I would borrow, steal, uh, imitate, uh, mutilate, staple and <laughs> spindle fold, uh, anything I could think of. Not much of his music is written down. There are now transcriptions of, uh, note for note transcriptions of some of his recordings, but uh, I figured most of these things out for myself. Uh, and I never really sat down to just play what he played because I couldn't. But I would play this little lick and this cool thing and this idea. And uh, basically, that's what I'm going to do for you now. I, this, I learned this tune from his playing. And uh, I, I suppose the key here would be just whatever you hear that makes you say, whoa, wow, that's our Tatum. And all the stuff between those moments, that would be me. <laughs> and uh, hope it works for you. I cover the waterfront. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, brought to tears. Uh, I am an artist, and I say that hardly as a boast, but more as a resigned admission. And the reason I feel this way, I, all my life, I've been very skeptical of artists and uh, never wanted to be one or be called one. Because I always thought it was either at its best, calling yourself an artist was either at its best just pretentious. And at its worst, it seemed like some kind of an excuse for being an egotistical jerk. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I really didn't want to be part of it. Uh, but in recent years, uh, I've realized that I am an artist. And I hope not in either of those two ways, but I, it has been pointed out to me, and it's irrefutable at this point, that artists, I, one of them, uh, have a completely different brain structure, if you could call it that, uh, than normal people. And my son, our son, Jill and me, uh, Henry, Many, many of you know, he's 29. He said recently to me, he said, you know, Dad, uh, people take magic mushrooms in order to spend two hours in the world that you just live in. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I, in, the, in the light of the song I'm about to play for you, which is called August, normally enough, uh, I think he's quite right, because as I say, the name of the song is August. But the backstory is this. I imagine riding on the back of a thistle seed as it, in late summer, as it gets lifted off its stalk and borne up into the air on a warm August breeze, a zephyr, if you will, and taken with no control of its own over treetops, over houses, over fields, over ponds, and then eventually gets dropped down in some unknown place and has to start a new life there. And I find that a very compelling image, and I find it very moving, the thought of this thistle, you know, like leaving its stalk, leaving its the only plant it's ever known. And then as it goes up into the sky to look down and see the other thistles around, you know, its friends and neighbors, and it's just heading off to places completely unknown and having to make a life. And I, you know, I find that compelling. I also think it's a beautiful metaphor for something we all go through in our way. We have to leave our homes, our familiarity, and go make a life someplace, often someplace utterly new. But <clears throat> it's been pointed out to me that, again, most people don't think about riding on the back of a thistle as it floats <laughs> over. And I, I acknowledge that, but I do, and I know other artists do as well. Uh, Henry, in his wisdom, uh, as you know, our kids teach us far more than we teach them if we really listen. He uh, was explaining the difference between his mother and his father to a friend of his, and his mother Jill, many of you know and love her, is a realtor, and I am a musician. And Henry said, well, let's put it this way. If my parents are walking along and, and see this huge field with a giant boulder in it, my mother is thinking, hmm, whose property is this? I wonder where the lines are. And, you know, is this for... And my father is wondering what the boulder is thinking. <laughs> <coughs> And I, uh, as he so often does, uh, I think he completely nailed it. So uh, I'm going to play for you, August. Uh, and after that, I'll play a song called Fireflies. So we won't have all this blabbing. But uh, I hope that you can uh, indulge me enough as an artist and join me as we go for a ride on a thistle.
Thank you, folks. Thank you so very, very much. It's time to wrap things up here. I'm just going to play one more song for you. Uh, <clears throat> I want to tell you again how thankful I am to you. I want to thank also all the people out in the Cyber Village uh, who are still around. Thank you for sticking with it. Eileen and Bill, good morning to you. And uh, of course, I want to thank uh, Dave and Dagny and Juniper. Uh, the director, the manager, and the staff, and also the volunteers. Luke, also, just met him this afternoon. Actually, I haven't seen him. He's a dark voice from the uh, high booth up there, but I know he's a very important figure, and this wouldn't be happening if it weren't for him. So thank you, too, Luke. Uh, I will let you all go. I <coughs> I'm going to play one more song. It's called Farewell to Maine. I've played it under many circumstances, happy and sad, uh, we are all forced to say farewell too many times in life. I know that uh, we're all have done it more than we want to and not as much as we will. But tonight, I offer it in a happy, thankful way and uh, send you home with farewell to Maine. 